Hello, everyone. Welcome to, to my presentation on, on this topic called expressive coding. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here talking to you, such a smart and a diverse crowd. Uh, thanks to the PyCon uh, organization as well. So my name is Half Scheidel, and I'm passionate about drawing with code. So in addition to, to my work that I do during the day, this is what I do on the side evenings and, and weekends. Um, but before I start, I want to ask you one question. So, uh, do raise your hand if you can confidently and would say in an interview that you, yeah, I'm a creative person. Do you feel that you would put that in your CV? That's that's really great. That's really great. Um, I I do feel that there is a um, there is a, a problem with creativity is the way um, perhaps most uh, when we talk about jobs or work that is said to be creative. Uh, I, there's something that uh, not only me, but a lot of people call the creativity myth, right? That is, is this idea that uh, it's only if you have a natural talent to, to paint or to draw or to play m music or whatever. Um, either you're you know, a natural or if you work in a certain industry, let's say you work in an advertisement, you're a graphic designer, you're a photographer or whatever, then you're part of the creative industry, right? You're a creative person. And I think that's a, a very limited uh, view of creativity has negative consequences to, to, to other people that you know would benefit just to try it out. And the truth is that you you can be creative in any field. Who recognized this guy here in the picture? Yeah, who who's that? The yes the yeah, no more. He he stepped down. This is the guy who who I think we can say that we are here today because of him, right? So he's the, Mr. Guido, he's the creator of the Python language. Um, come on, you have to be creative to, to come up with a new programming language, right? Um, but I would say that it's everywhere, like any job that, that you need to, to solve problems, have new problems uh, um, on, a, on a regular basis, you need to be creative, right? Um, and more than that, coding or programming or creating software, it's inherently a creative activity. Uh, we all might feel that uh, when working with technology, oh, this again, like you, that there's a certain degree of repetition of pattern. But I would say that what attracts us as working with, with, with technology and, and especially with software is the possibility of, okay, I can do this now. I can exercise my brain. I can come up with a new solution. And that's, uh, and that's creativity on top of everything. Yes. And, but we can take a step further. What if you use code and programming? with the explicit intent of creating visuals, of creating something that is um, more, f instead of, if you, you're here for Eros presentation, he talked about software engineering as, as having a, a functional perspective, right? You have a, a specification, you have, you have to implement something that solves a problem or, or behaves in a spectacular way. With what I call expressive coding, not only me, creative coding is a, bro it's a more well-known term, but I would like to use the expressive coding is the idea of um, of using code to to not to fo not focusing on an ex on a functional behavior, but more on an expressive side of it. Meaning that you um, it doesn't matter so much how it performs as long as you know it's code that runs, compiles, and runs. Uh, you're more interested in the in the output of that, and the output can be um, it can be visual, but it doesn't have to be visual. It can be also music, for example, right? Or it can be it can be also words, text. Um, so generally speaking, is when we talk about the uh, focus on the output. Uh, another word is uh, another way of saying it is that you program with an aesthetic intent. That's perhaps a more stiff definition, a bit more formal, um, but it's the same idea. So you you code doesn't matter the language. Um, today we're talking about Python, but it can be in, in any language also. Languages that are visual programming, node-based programming, that is not necessarily like you're just writing. Um, and of course, with any uh, artistic process, intention and technique are very important. Like knowing how to do things and, and knowing different techniques both expands what you can generate, but also allows you to do more sophisticated things, right? So as, uh, the more you, you develop a technique. But at the same time, um, there's room and a large degree of experimentation. So when you're programming with that, you know, that you're not focused on solving a problem, uh, that frees you a little bit on how that code should work uh, and allows you just to experiment with things as well. So even if you, 
for example, when you would draw in with code, uh, it's very often that you end up um, thinking about maths, right? It's like thinking about uh, trigonometry and, and this, the primitives, how, how, um, how a square is defined or a circle is defined in space, um, and that helps a lot. But even without not having full control of that, so you have code, and I think when you program it with a, with an, uh, you know, you're building software, you have to know why the, the code is operating in a certain way, right? You want to actually know exactly how it behaves. When you're doing this, it's, like it's, it's not so much. I mean, you can still, as long as you like the result, sometimes it's by com complete mistake or it's just try and error, and it's, it's okay to, to throw in stuff, right? You just throw in, you know, functions to, to change the color, functions to change the position, as long as you, you like, um, or you're satisfied. I'll say satisfied is better because you might also dislike and it's still like, oh, what is this? And it's still, it's something meaningful to you, right? So not all um, interactions with, with visuals can be a, a pleasing one, right? It can be one that can just trigger anxiety or, or, or you know, make, makes you think about different things and, uh, and that's the beauty of art. Uh, but a lot of degree, a, a great degree of experimentation and unpredictability. And this is, uh, it's a lot of fun. So I'm going to show you a few examples now of stuff that I, I did um, in the last couple of years, um, using different programming languages, different techniques, also combining different things. Um, this piece is called Time, and I did it uh, um, using Java and in an environment that's called Processing. A few of you I spoke right use Processing. It's both a, a library, a library that you can use in, a, in your IDE, but also um, an environment that uh, um, simplifies, simplifies um, writing code. It's a great way for beginners also to get started with programming because it removes all the, the plumbing needed to run. Basically, you can just write one line, hit this play button, and it's up and running. Good. Um, time is, is the piece that uh, I used to actually print it. This is a, it's a card that I made last year, and uh, it's the same drawing here. And what we're going to do today is, during the demo is to... This was done in Java, but I'll try to show you the ideas behind and how we can do it in, in, in Python. Uh, the next one is the interactive gallery. This is a, a piece that... Uh, it's an interactive piece, so meaning that... Uh, the audience, the presence of the, the uh, an audience changes the behavior of the piece, right? Um, this uses Kinect, uh, Kinect, the distinct Kinect from Microsoft was a wonderful piece of hardware. And I used the 3D camera or the depth sensor of the Kinect to, to read, oh, is there someone in front of the TV? And then you use your hands to kind of paint the, the canvas and reveal um, in a pixelated effect and then reveal a, a picture in the back. Good. So this Kinect is, is the hardware. Then I was running Windows, so I used .NET. Then the browser was using JavaScript uh, and 3JS. It's a, it's a library for using um, WebGL and the, canva, and the canvas in the browser. A simpler one that is uh, called Diagonal. Uh, it's just a GIF. It's just a GIF, but uh, it's, used, uh, it's great using code. Um, it's, it's inspired on um, painting by, um, by an Argentinian artist, um, and if you dissect this, if you look at this drawing, it's essentially squares in two colors, right? And if you say that, well, the black one is the background, so then it's just one color, which is white. Um, so creating this with code, I think if you have a programming mindset, you look at this like, yeah, I see a square rotated, and it rotates with time, and then it scales into a small size and a bigger size, right? That's essentially what it is, and it shows the... Um, I picked this to show that it's, it, with very little you can create uh, uh, fun stuff. This other one is um, it's a piece that was also created using uh, processing this library. And there is an audio part, but I hope I muted. Yes. So this is the Harpa concert hall in, in Reykjavik in Iceland. Um, and the facade is, even though it's, it's very big, it's very low resolution. So meaning the pixels there are I think it was type 20 by 30. And there was a call, so a call for artists that you just you send an animation. And then uh, mine was called uh, Inf Infinitesimal. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but uh, uh, it's an animation that's inspired on water. So with the audio, the audio is like a thunder and rain. Um, 
In terms of code, also very, very simple. Um, next one is perhaps just to give an idea of how far you can go and also the, where the lines get blurred, I meaning is this a hobby or is, it, or is it a professional work? Because the techniques, they are used in, in many fields. They are used in, 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 for example, in visual effects or special effects. Um, and the technique can take you far, but you don't need to, to worry about uh, to get started. So I use this uh, comparison because I think the one on the right, um, it's, it's a procedurally generated eye, basically. So, so this artist called Arthur, he used code and, uh, and the, the GPU by using this um, WebGL API. So basically it's JavaScript running the browser. Oops, sorry. And um, so my point is that the same techniques um, can be very sophisticated. You can take it very far, um, but it's available. You can read the code and see how, this, how it was did. I'm not saying that you can understand everything, even if you don't have experience on how this was used, uh, but it can take you very far. The one on the left is also to show the technique, meaning that, that it's a, definitely a, a very special piece uh, and technique counts a lot. Um, but you don't need to have the technique to get started, to, to experiment with art. That's what, what I mentioned at the beginning, right? You can still just try out and see how, how it goes. Um, this eye actually is, um, uh, I think is very realistic and you can open on your phone. So if you have a modern phone and you navigate here, you'll you see that. A few more examples. Um, print work. So I do a lot of uh, work that it's, it's meant to be or is thought of, of, of being suitable for printing, um, meaning that I work a lot with static images. So I run code and I create an image that is not necessarily an animation. That's what I do um, most of the time. And this Tyler Hobbs is an artist that uh, um, his workflow, again, it's, it's not because of he knows the language, but he evolved into a workflow that uses closure. Has it, does anyone code in closure here? Yeah? That's cool. So you can try this, uh, doing this enclosure. And the reason he, for doing that, what I understand is that um, he likes to do um, an iterative approach, an exploratory that uh, uh, for him is very important to, to just make changes and, and keep and run the code again. And that works really well. Another thing is that uh, I mentioned, if you read the description of the talk, that generative art is a lot about a very controlled randomness. So you, it's random, but it's very controlled. Like you, you define where you're going to apply randomness. Is it in shape? Is it in color? Is it in position? In speed of the animation? Um, and, and, and languages that are, how can I say that this, that have a more of a functional aspect that you can use functions uh, as, as, to, to, as parameters of other functions, it, then it's a very good fit for this because um, when you're building, it's, it's more like you're adding layers. It's the same thing if you're painting, right? Abstract art. So you're adding layers that uh, can be um, then a function that controls the, the frequency of a sine wave, for example. And then being able to pile these functions on top of each other helps a lot. Good. Um, another common form of, of it's more like web friendly is making GIFs. And uh, I'll leave here a list of three. Um, this one that's running here, I think it's mind-blowing, and it's uh, by an artist called Etienne Jacob. I don't know if you can see in details, but it's essentially dots and triangles. And perhaps a little bit of math sauce there to create this effect. Um, to get started, or, or let's say what people are using out there, it's, 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 it's really broad. There's a lot of stuff, and some are hobbyists, other are professionals, like in industry, such as um, um, DJing or, or visuals uh, for, for movies. Um, and there's also this thriving community that, you know, um, visual artists that collaborate with musicians to, to create their live show, for example. And this, it, this is a non-exhaustive list. Uh, it's just to show that there's, you know, stuff that is more for the web. It's stuff that uh, if you want to have, have it, if, if stability is a concern, right, you need something to be running for three hours and you can't afford any any failures, any hiccups, you might go towards um, using C++, for example. Um, I use a lot uh, processing Java and JavaScript, and today I'm going to try and uh, show, show this Python mode of processing that is the, um, 
It's a bit hacky because you know if you're a purist, like oh, I want to run Python. This is not exactly that because it's um, it's transpiling uh, Python into Java, but you code in Python. But also means that uh, not the whole like the most advanced uh, Python features might not be available. Um, but I hope you enjoy it. Um, here, why I think we all should do it, should give it a try, is reason one is that it's a very low investment, low entry barrier. So um, even if you're just getting started with Python, um, you don't need to know even so much on, on by heart how to write a, a function or something that, that runs without any errors because this, the, let's say the environment will take care of the plumbing for you. So you might write just one line, run, and it will, it will show stuff on the screen. Um, that's to get started, but also that uh, you should try because you can really go really far. So if, if you're more into music, or you want to explore interaction with music and visuals, or if you like 3D stuff, or if you're more into games, and you want to give a try how, how for example, how uh, certain visual effects are created. Um, if you're more into maths, you're a lot, you're like, you feel that you like to work mathematics and function and trigonometry, um, you can do shaders, for example. That's a way of writing these scripts that run directly in the GPU. Uh, you can do uh, amazing stuff there. Second reason to experiment, try to uh, exercise new perspectives, be a child again, meaning that you, you just take a piece of paper and you draw stuff there, and you don't really care if it means something or if others would, how others would relate to that. And just for you to, to yourself, to like, how do I feel about this? Do I think it's ugly or pretty? Um, hopefully more dimensions, right? Do you think it's weird? Do I like it? Do I feel good about it? Do I feel sad about it? Um, and I think that's really good. It's like it's, you, you're practicing, um, or let's say exercising, actively exercise different parts of your brain and can be helpful in many spheres of life. And thirdly, to have fun, right? Have fun with, uh, with code. So if you're a professional coder, um, it's likely that you've done something around this before. Um, and uh, another thing is to be comfortable that there'll be no one checking your code, like, oh, you, this is not PEP8 compliant here. Like, it, it doesn't matter, right? As long as you run, um, remember the, the focus is in the output. Um, good. This is an exercise of doing exactly that to, um, as part of a, a course that I, um, I gave at the Beckman School of Design. So we took the students to, to the Modern Museum in Stockholm, and they were just sketching. So sketching as, as drawing artists go to, to a museum, and they, they have a sketch pad. And the, and the whole point of sketching is that it's not necessarily to, to copy what you're doing there, it's to take inspiration. And another aspect of sketching is that, said, yeah, I'm done with this. I, enough, I, I didn't like it, or it doesn't work, or it's too hard, or it's just to get an idea out, and then you move to, the, to another one. And uh, processing is, is um, organized around sketches, too, that you just uh, write something, I like it or not, then you create a new one, and uh, you can create a quite um, messy files there, but it doesn't matter. The idea is that you can create as many as, um, as you wish. Good. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of, of coding. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. This is uh, part of it is recorded because uh, the time here is very constrained. But uh, also that it's easy for me to talk at the same time. I won't be able to to do it at the same time. Uh, here's the processing environment, and um, line two is just saying that I want my canvas to be of 800 by 800, and with a white background. Then um, ellipse will you tell the position, like x and y, of the where it's going to be drawn and the sizes, right? That was a bit fast, but he continues then uh, showing, uh, saying that now, okay, I want something to be painted with zero. Zero means black. That's the fill. No stroke, and then doing um, well a matrix, right? I know that you can combine these two fours there, like you could do that in one line um, for clarity reasons here. Not, but I also because you cannot do. How is that? How do you combine that? You do iteration tools, and you do like a product, right, of these two ranges. And you can do this in one line. Good, that's just dots. I, I like this already. Like, I think this is pretty. Um, the next thing I do is just to switch. I do the X. So that's another function that is very used in drawing is the, how do you call it, the modulus? Is that how you call it? And that's very much used I, in, in many ways. But here the idea is that every second line, I shift the, the, the dots, and it becomes more like a 
displaced, right? Every second line, it goes a little bit to the front. So this is kind of the, the idea, it's not show the visual, but this for you to get an idea how it works. You do changes, you run it again. Some are very well controlled, uh, others are, are not. Um, if, this, if I was working on this, the next steps would be, for example, to um, remember randomness, controlled randomness. I would probably explore uh, randomness in the size. Can I, what if I put a function to control the size of these dots? Uh, the position of the dots or, or the color of the dots. So usually the dimensions of size, position, and, uh, and color are usually the ones that you start playing with, right? Um, just a few lines of code. The next example is um, it's similar, but I want to pave the way now to time. Um, and the idea is to, is to... Let me try and pause here. Oops. Um, so to draw a triangle, right? So you need three points. Uh, each point is two coordinates. So basically, you need six numbers, right? You need six floats or whatever number. Um, so this is going to to draw a triangle, and and this is where it's it's Python is nice to work with because you can do stuff like that. So what I'm doing now is to create um, um, six random numbers, and in Python or let's say in processing. Uh, this is a processing function of the Python one that uh, says random 400 is going to return anything between 0 and 400. And I'm getting six of these, right? So I'm getting a list of six numbers. Um, and I, when I use this um, this star, the asterisk, so how is that called in Python? So the triangle star or asterisk vertices. Basically what that does is... What is that? Basically, it just breaks the list into six numbers, right? Because the triangle expects six numbers and not a list. Um, that's how you draw one triangle. You saw there is an animation here. That's because the draw function is a loop, so it keeps looping. Good. The next thing now is to uh, I'll show you the the actual code here. Um, good. So um, this is the same idea. There is a bit more code here to, to control the lines. But the, what I did here, instead of drawing just one, I create a list here of uh, a loop for um, creating dots around the circle. So if you use this, like there is a R for radius, and then I'm adding here um, an angle that is between 0 and 2 pi, multiplied by the sine of the angle. So if I do a lot of this, basically I'm drawing uh, dots around a circle, right? Um, then in the draw, so basically this is preparing the, the, the points, and then in draw, I pick out of this list, I pick three points, draw a triangle, I pick the next three points, draw another uh, triangle. This is how it looks. The circle is just to give an idea how that the points are actually falling on the circle. Um, again, what I do next, I, this is also, I don't know if this is, this is what I'm doing here. Basically, I pick from the list of points, um, and then I divide this list into a list of list of six points. So basically, I have a big bag of points. I put them in smaller bags of six numbers each, right? Because the triangle expects six numbers. Good. So you saw the result. So again, as an iterative process, I would just draw more triangles. And they'll look like this. Um, then this looks ugly. Uh, but the next thing is, that is very used here is, is playing with transparency. So I talked about randomness, controlled randomness, then um, the transparency and repetition, right? So if you use a lot of repetition, transparency is your friend because uh, you get different results by accumulating that uh, over and over. So basically what I did, this alpha value here is the transparency value. Um, now, I don't know how it looks there for you, but it's, it's very kind of faded. I'll remove the circle that's here, just comment it out. And more points, go crazy. Like, you know, what if I type a uh, wrong zero here and then, and then see what happens? And oh, maybe it's a bit too much, no. Then it gets too solid, right? Too dark, so one fewer zero. Yeah, getting there. The final version is just a more controlled way of drawing these triangles. Um, and it looks like like this. So basically, it's the same code, but just I, I do here on the, on the um, adding these points. I first I pick one, 
So I do angle, I pick one, and then the other two points I do a little bit further from that, but not too far. So I want to have these triangles kind of close in the, in the circle, close to each other. And this is the, the piece. And then the question is like, when do you stop? When do you know that, uh, that uh, it's done? What you never do is more like when your wife tells you that uh, she's going to bed and if you want to stay there, it's up to you. Or, or, or you just practice that. It's, like it's, a, it's a also an exercise on, on letting go, right? This is, this is what I did today. Um, and, uh, and if you like it, you can create a copy of this sketch and then run another one the other day. Um, and this is kind of this. Um, very good. And that's, that's the demo. I hope you, you enjoyed. Um, oops. I think now I broke it. But thank you very much for, the, the, for your time. For, I hope you found this interesting and give it a try. Do install the, the processing and, uh, tool and, and install the Python mode or even try with, with another language such as JavaScript and, and have fun with it. So thanks a lot for the talk. Do we have any questions? Have you ever experimented with creating art from data that comes from like API? Yes. Something like what we are doing today about, let's say, like a census data set. Yes. And then creating art from that. Yeah, I didn't talk about, but using data is a very common way of um, of doing this. Like, and and then there's there's a trend that, or let's say, people that we use to create infographics, so they actually want to create a a representational. Uh, how can I say? They actually want people to relate to the data. They want you to, to see the patterns that the data represents. So that's a more kind of straightforward, or let's say you, you don't want to, you want to, to be informative, right? And that's, that's very much used. Uh, um, that's also where Python is a good fit because, you, you know, treating the data and calling the APIs and so on uh, is very good. Um, myself, have I used? Ah, yes, I did something with the Spotify API that I, Spotify API gives some very interesting, um, numbers about the about the songs like they have this they calculate something that's called danceability and i think that's what they use to create the suggestions so i downloaded that and i created a a queen poster <laughs> and that's a infographic and um um but a lot of people use like you know the weather data pollution data or or uh, economic uh, figures to to create drawings Did you experiment with uh, making music as well this way? Yes, I, 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 I play, but I don't spend a lot of time coding, but it's, the, the tools here and the techniques are very much used in music. Um, the, let's say the requirements or the type of software is, is, a, is a bit different. Uh, and as someone wisely tried to say that, let's say that the, the programming for music is less, um, Let's say you kind of need to know a little bit more. You need to know a little bit how, how music is represented and, and, and the, the relationship between the frequencies to create something that you're not going to... Yeah, that sounds meaningful and, and it's, you know, it's also a cultural thing, but uh, um, I would say that the, uh, the entry barrier for, for creating music uh, is a bit higher, but definitely you can do it. And the processing library has also um, a part to, to, to do music with it. Do we have some other questions? Great talk, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, have you been experimenting with uh, machine learning as well to generate art somehow? Yes, I didn't talk about it, it was intentional, but I, I haven't myself, and uh, what I did was to use it, right? So it's more like you use these trained models to, to do style transfer, for example. I haven't coded myself, and I, um, I think it's... Um, a matter of interest, I, I, my opinion also, if you disagree, it's totally fine, but that, that's more of an exercise in, in programming than, than in creativity. And of course, it's very good to know how these things work. Uh, 
but I, I think to me, it's, I, I enjoy more this. Maybe it's more more my comfort zone. And uh, I would say that if I were to try that, I wouldn't. I would try to use that as as one building block, right? So you generate the elements, or and then you try to make I don't know collages or or layers of that. But the I would say the the artists that are doing this, for example, there is one uh, I saw in New York that uh, uh, he uses. Um, uh, these, he uses guns to, to with data from different places, like historical pictures of New York, and he creates animations. And uh, uh, it's very pretty; it's very impressive. Uh, but it's it's a much more of a of a technical or programming exercise than of, of creating things from scratch. It, it becomes also more complex. Like the, let's say the the effort and the time spent with code is a bit higher. But definitely, it's, there's a lot happening there. So if you if machine learning is your thing, um, check the artist using machine learning for for creating visuals and and yeah, installations. So thanks a lot. I have still a certificate for you and a speaker back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.